right now, somewhere between the orbits of the two most distant planets in the solar system, Uranus and Neptune, a comet is accelerating towards us. This comet has no name yet, and no human being has ever had a chance of seeing it. This comet is moving with the impressive 25,000 kilometers per hour. And even with this speed, it's going to take it at least another few years until it comes close enough to the sun where it reaches the brightness that's enough for the most powerful telescopes that we have to detect it. And once we discover it, we have just a few years to prepare. Don't worry, this comet is not going to impact the Earth. In fact, it is going to be the target of our space mission. Our space mission is called Comet Interceptor, and it is funded by the European Space Agency in collaboration with the Japanese Space Agency. And we've been preparing it for five years already, and we'll keep on working on it until it launches at the end of the decade. And together with over 200 other scientists and engineers, I have the privilege and the fun to be part of this amazing effort. And even though uh, this sounds like a dream come true, I'll have to admit that exploring comets and asteroids was never my childhood dream. As you heard, I grew up in a family of astronomers, and most of my childhood memories come from their classrooms, where they taught many students about the amazing objects in space, and also took us outdoors under the clear sky to observe some of the most impressive phenomena in the sky. And this sparked my curiosity about space. But because I was so aware of all of the objects in the universe, the question for me wasn't what most people think when they imagine space. What is out there and how can we reach it? For me, the question which always drove me was what can these objects teach us that we don't know yet? And this question drove me throughout my studies between five or six countries, until the decisive moment came that would determine the career uh, that I am on now. But before this moment happened, I wasn't really interested in the solar system. To me, it sounded like kindergarten knowledge. Already from a small child, I knew that the solar system has asteroids and it has comets, besides the planets and the moons. And these billions of small bodies that we have are relics from the past. So the asteroids formed in the early solar system, close to the sun, and that's why they're the so-called rocky bodies. The comets, on the other hand, they formed in the outer solar system, where it was very cold, and they preserved ices. And after they formed, they were stored even further away from the sun, where it was so cold that they remained almost unchanged until now, until they come close to the sun, they get heated up, and the gases in them get unstable, and they release dust and gas that forms their beautiful tails in the sky. But that was the story I knew, and it never sparked more interest in me. Until this one moment that happened to be decisive for my career happened. There was the comet Ison. It was predicted to be the next bright comet that we're going to see with the naked eye in the sky. I was getting excited, and then it disappeared. It didn't survive its closest passage to the sun. It got too hot and just couldn't survive as a whole body. It all evaporated. And that's when I realized that comets are almost as unpredictable as life is, because this moment changed my career. I was so surprised that we couldn't predict whether a comet is going to survive or not, that that sparked my curiosity, and it started my career in cometary science. Since then, I spend most of my time thinking about comets almost every single day. And what I've learned so far is that these comets formed, as I told you, early on in the solar system formation. They formed while the planets were forming, and they're the leftover building blocks that didn't make it into the contents of the planet. These objects then got scattered around. So the pl planets stayed in their spots, moved a little bit around, but comets and asteroids went all over the place. And as this was happening, some of these objects impacted our planet. And these impacts turned out to be crucial 
for the formation of life on our planet. We believe that these early on impacts deliver the organics and the water necessary for life on our planet to form. So they play a significant influence on the formation of life as we know it today. On the other hand, they also pose threats. A little bit later on, as life had evolved for millions of years, these objects continued impacting our planet just much more rarely. So impacts didn't happen all the time, but they happened every now and day, and every now and then, and they were detrimental. This is what we believe happened to dinosaurs. An impact by a big asteroid caused the climate on the planet to change drastically, which put the last nail in the coffin for dinosaurs, and they disappeared. Luckily for us, our civilization has developed much more than that of the dinosaurs ever had a chance of reaching. We have built huge amounts of knowledge and also huge instruments like these telescopes that you see here. And these telescopes allow me and other colleagues to map the solar system, to study the individual objects, and to see what they can tell us about our environment in the solar system and what we can expect to learn from them and also to experience if they ever find us on our planet. But I'm sure that you will believe me that just looking is not enough. Sometimes you just have to go and see it for yourself. So imagine that you've been out and about exploring a hot city, looking at sites all day until you finally reach this platform where you see the whole city. You see binoculars in front of you and you decide to look through them. And somehow your eyes are drawn to everybody who is having ice cream. You see these people, they're enjoying the ice cream and immediately you want to go there and find the best ice cream in town. The one that's going to taste the best and that's going to be the best experience to wrap up your day. But how do you know where the best ice cream is? You cannot really guess what the flavors are and the smells are before you go there and try it for yourself. And similarly to this, we develop space missions. Space missions allow us to go and examine these objects from close by and extract information that's just not accessible when we study them from afar. That's why we have developed so many space missions that send probes to these objects. Some of them just pass by them for a short period of time and collect tremendous amounts of data that then they transmit to Earth. Some others land on the surfaces of these small bodies, asteroids and comets. And we have even achieved as humanity collectively, missions that have delivered space samples to us. They have taken small amounts of these bodies and brought them to our laboratories here on Earth where we can examine them with the most powerful instruments that we have. As I told you, missions have been sent to asteroids. And asteroids, they teach us about the inner solar system. They tell us what it was like closer to the sun. However, they don't contain ice, or at least it's very, very hard to detect it in them. It's like this ice cream cone. You don't know whether there is any ice cream inside or whether there ever was any ice cream nearby this cone. So if you want to learn about the materials from the outer solar system where the ice is, you need to go and study the comets. And that's what we have done. Spacecraft have visited a number of comets so far with some really exciting space missions that have really developed our knowledge about the solar system from its beginning until today. But these missions to comets have only managed to visit comets which are already processed. Comets on orbits which have been close to the sun for a long time. These objects have been processed by the heat of the sun and we no longer can tell what the ices truly were in the very early ages of the solar system. And that's why we want to go and visit a truly unchanged comet, a comet that is coming closer to the sun for the very first time. This sounds beautiful, 
And it is the goal of our mission, but it's very, very challenging. The challenge comes from the fact that these comets come from very far away. They come from the Oort cloud. The Oort cloud is the shell of the solar system, very, very far away from us, halfway to the next star. And this shell contains hundreds of billions, even trillions of comets. And yet, only one such comet comes close to the Earth per year, comes close enough for a spacecraft to reach it. And unfortunately, we have no idea where exactly it's going to come from. On top of that, they're very hard to find. When they're far away from the Earth, they're so faint that we have no chances of seeing them. Gradually approaching the sun, their brightness increases until we can detect them. But then, that comes too late. That gives us just a few years. And usually, the development of a spacecraft instrument takes years, even decades in some cases. Developing such complicated instruments that are rigorously tested and able to explore objects in deep space without any faulty results, without any failures of the instruments, is a very difficult task that takes a long time. And that's why we haven't been able to discover a comet, then prepare a spacecraft and send it to it. And that's why we have developed a mission that overcomes this challenge. The idea of our mission, Comet Interceptor, is quite simple in principle. We build our instruments, we get ready for exploration in space, we develop instruments that are capable to deliver the results that we need from getting close to a comet, and then once we're ready, we send it to space without knowing where exactly it's going to go in the end. So what we do first is we park. We park in a stable orbit, and in this stable orbit, the object can spend up to a few years. It, during this waiting period, we don't waste our time, we continue preparing, and we prepare to discover the right comet that's go going to give us the most information. Once we discover suitable targets, our task is to evaluate them, to actually determine whether they're safe to be close by for our instruments, and whether they're actually going to make it to the meeting point, because as I told you earlier, comets sometimes surprise us and disappear. And once we're sure that we have a comet that we can reach, we calculate the trajectory to it. This is a complicated task, but luckily the engineers are proficient at it. We can determine where the comet is going to be a few years from now, and we can send the spacecraft to it. And once the orbits of the spacecraft and the comet meet, this meeting period where we can collect data lasts just a few hours. And during these few hours, our task is to perform a carefully choreographed sequence of instrument commands so that the instruments on board Comet Interceptor and the two probes that get close to the comet gather sufficient data to give us the pieces that we're missing in the puzzle of the solar system formation and evolution. This is all amazing. It's a absolutely a dream come true for every cometary scientist, because for the first time we'll get measurements from such a comet. But the, the true amazing nature of our space mission, for me, comes from the potential of testing the strategy. We're going to test the strategy of parking in space until we have a target that we want to reach for the very first time. And this opens the door for us to actually protect our planet. Planetary defense is an important task because impacts on our planet are very rare but not impossible. And while we use our telescopes to discover all of the potentially hazardous objects, comets and asteroids that might hit us, we're not sure that we're not going to miss one that surprises us and gives us a very short time to go and deflect it. And our strategy, if we're parked in space, in full readiness to reach this object and deflect its orbit. This is amazing potential. But spaceflight is there not just for science, not just for the practical reasons of defending our planet. Space exploration is there to inspire and to motivate humanity. 
And I think the true meaning of our space mission is that it teaches us how to achieve success. In my view, success comes when curiosity drives you to prepare. And once you are prepared, you're in the right spot where opportunities can find you. With this, I think that curiosity is what is the driving force of achieving success. And curiosity is what is going to take us where success is going to find us eventually. Благодаря ви много за вниманието. Надявам се всички да сте се помечтали малко за космоса и за успеха. Искам да ви оставя с въпроса какъв е успеха, за който вие си мечтаете и как любопитството ще ви доведе там. Благодаря.